so uh, Rabbi Gershko always uh, jokes that uh, it's, uh, she uh, never wants to have to come after a gold bloom, which I made her do last week at a breakfast. And now I have to go after her, and I have learned never go after Rabbi Gershko. <laughs> so, and what I want to say is I am going to tell you a personal story. It is my personal story. It's not about me, but it's, I want to help you see uh, sort of what happens with women and religion from a different perspective. So I come from what you might call a faithless, non-religious family. My parents identified ethnically Jewish, though I have to say I have one grandmother who was Ukrainian Catholic, but my parents were adamant atheists. And still, they raised me with an incredibly deep religious faith in humanity. And my parents shared a passion for social justice. They were two working class kids from Brooklyn and the Bronx who met just after my father returned from serving in Europe as a young soldier during World War II. And independently, they both discovered communism. They married and they were sent by the party to liberate the masses in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> And I do not know how they pulled off. They, they were in a community where there were no Jews, and I have no idea how they pulled it off that they somehow fit in with that community. But for 10 years, they were part of the underground communist movement, and I was born a red diaper baby. <laughs> By the time I was four years old, my parents had become disillusioned with Stalin and with the party. Their dream had been to improve life for the people they had come from the poor and the marginalized. It was a dream they never completely abandoned, especially my mother. Those values were as strong as any religious values you could possibly grow up with. I was taught that what mattered was what you did in this life, not just how you treated others, but what you did to bring justice into this world. When my parents left the party, they both got jobs working for a famous synagogue in Cleveland. And I loved that temple. And in that brief and very young period of my life, I became a faithful Jew. I loved God, I loved the stories from the Torah, and I announced to my family, much to their amusement, that I would one day marry a rabbi. <laughs> I had never encountered any female religious leader as a child, so I never visualized myself as a religious leader. I didn't think it was possible. When I turned eight, my one and only older brother informed my parents that he did not want to become a bar mitzvah. On that day, my entire family revealed to me, they basically came out of the closet and told me that they were atheists, and we left the temple. It was a watershed moment in my life. Suddenly, I became aware of the contradictions of the wider world. Violent scenes from the Vietnam War were raging on the TV screen at home. My connection with God was severed, and I stepped out into a spiritual desert that I would cross for years. I was 23 years old when my husband and I decided to marry. We'd met in New York City. He came from an Episcopalian family, so I guess here you would say Anglican. But he had long ago left his faith. And it was his mother who begged us, please, please, get married in a church. And my mother said, well, just don't mention God. <laughs> so the solution was the Unitarians. Right? <laughs> A religious movement without dogma or creed who welcomed atheists, agnostics, as well as believers and seekers and drew inspiration from many sources, not just one. We were married in a universalist, Unitarian Universalist church in Brooklyn, New York. And it was my husband who wanted to reconnect with religious community. So we began that process that some people called church shopping. It was strange to me trying to find a spiritual home in a place that called itself a church. I could hardly say the word then, which is ironic now. <laughs> I was 28 years old with a new babe in arms when we discovered a beautiful Unitarian Universalist community in Montclair, New Jersey. 
I stuck one toe in the door, and that congregation pulled me in, my whole body pulled in. I was so moved. I cried every time I was in the sanctuary. I had found home. It was a place that allowed me to hold on to my humanist upbringing, my love for the Jewish faith of my childhood, and gave me room to question and explore other sources of religious inspiration, including what we Unitarians call the religion of Jesus rather than the religion about Jesus. It was the first time that I also encountered female spiritual leaders. For the first few years, I ran the children's preschool in the church so that I would not have to participate in adult services. I could not handle being in adult services, which is another irony today because I'm now in the sanctuary leading services every <coughs> Sunday. During the week back then, I was working on Wall Street, rising up the corporate ladder in the online information industry before there was an internet. Mm -hmm. But that work was killing me, and the church I served, and the children I served in my church saved my soul. Before I knew it, I became a leader in that congregation. And that was such a gift from that community, because I did not have faith in myself. And I think that's something that our communities can always do, is that we can give people, young people, faith in themselves. And people started to tell me that I was meant to be a minister. But I kept saying, no thanks. I saw how hard ministers worked, how many impossible expectations and demands their congregations placed on them, and I said, no way. And it was this, as if God kept calling me to say that I should enter the ministry, and I kept saying, you have the wrong number. It's not me. It's not me. You're calling somebody else. Years passed, I had two children, I left the corporate world, I became a Montessori teacher, my family moved to Boston, and we became active at a Unitarian Universalist church in Concord, Massachusetts, which is the historic heart of American Unitarianism. I eventually became their paid religious educator. As I ministered to children and their families, I came to realize that yes, I was, I was called to the ministry. As I contemplated entering seminary as a middle-aged woman who hadn't been in school for years, I worried that I wouldn't have the stamina to make it through, that I wouldn't be smart enough. And I remember sharing my doubts with my mother, my mother who is no longer living, but I said to her at that time, I said, Mom, I don't know if I should do this. I really don't, because you know, by the time I finish, I'm gonna be almost 50. And my mother said, you'll be 50 anyway. <laughs> Remember that. Whenever you say you can't do something, whatever age it is, you'll be that age anyway. So my first day of seminary was on September 11th, 2001. I was on my way to Harvard Divinity School when I learned that the first tower had been struck at the World Trade Center in New York. By the time we were midway through our orientation, we learned that the second tower and the Pentagon had been hit. The days that followed were profound. As future religious leaders, we knew that everything had changed. I remember an African-American student telling a Muslim student, I am so sorry, you will now have to live through what we have always lived with. In those days, we were all thirsting for more knowledge about Islam, and I took a course with Egyptian author Leila Ahmed about women and the veil. And she would say to us, the veil is your Western obsession. That course changed my life. It opened my eyes to the many assumptions we make about the other when we really don't know the other. I came to know Muslim women for the first time in my life, and I knew women who were veiled and women who didn't veil, each one, each of them making their own decision based on their relationship with their faith and not on what someone else told them to do, not their fathers, their brothers, or their husbands. These women were feminists. When I was called to serve as the minister of the Unitarian Church of Montreal in 2006, I had no idea how important that education would be. In my very first year here, 
Quebec began questioning its relationship to new immigrants and remember all that talk about reasonable accommodation? Yeah, I know. It's like we never want to hear that again, but it's still here. That, that debate is still here. Uh, and let's face it, most of the talk was really focused on Islamophobia, with Jews and Sikhs thrown into the mix. Veiled what Muslim women became the central target and arguments were made about feminism, which in practice really called for taking away the right of one group of women to express themselves as they chose. When I first spoke about the right for Muslim women to choose to veil themselves, some people in my own congregation were shocked. They could not believe that I would say something like that. And we have come a long way since then. And I was so proud of my community when they went through a democratic process. And during the difficult days of the proposed Quebec Charter, secular charter, we created and hung a banner outside the church with many religious symbols and the words, vivre ensemble, live in harmony. And that's before the mayor's office decided to use that theme. That was a while ago. But it was a major thing to do to actually put that banner outside to actually say this is where we stand in this very heated debate in this city and in this province. And this is what has become my true call, to speak out and take action against intolerance in any form. These were the values that I grew up with and they continue to inform my faith. And I thought, I don't know, I think I'm older than some of the panelists here. And just so you know, I'm 60 and I am a grandmother. And I'm doing all those obnoxious grandmother things. But when I first became a Unitarian Universalist, there were very few women serving as clergy. In our movement today, female clergy are coming to outnumber male clergy. But we still face challenges in gaining respect and keeping wages up. And the truth is, as we have more women going into the ministry, the wages are going down. When I first came to Montreal 11 years ago, it was a big adjustment for some in my congregation to accept a female leader. I had replaced a male minister who was over six feet tall. He had a big barrel chest and a big booming voice. And it took time for the community to adjust to a different presence. At that time, there were very few female clergy in Montreal. So I was often the go-to person when a female voice was needed in interfaith events. And it was hard sometimes to know, OK, I'm the token here. And it also made me feel like, OK, I'm going to do something different here, like not just go blah, 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 blah for a half an hour. Maybe I'll make everybody sing or do something really unexpected. But I'm so glad to see how much the landscape has changed. Today, there is greater openness to women here, and I'm encouraged by the growing acceptance I see of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender leadership in my own movement and elsewhere. But there are still times when I'm saddened to see a photo, not, a photo op in the news showing a gathering of religious leaders and politicians, and there is not one single female religious leader present. Our religious movements are changing, but the old images and expectations are so slow to die. When politicians feel they need to make a statement and they want to be surrounded by religious leaders, who do they call? They still call the guys, which means we've still got more work to do. I know I'm here thanks to my mother and the other amazing women in my life who have been my role models. I think we as female religious leaders need to encourage more young women and anyone who identifies with feminine and feminist spirit to join us in this work. It's not easy, but together we really do have the capacity to change what is often a cold and intolerant world. We hold up half the sky for a good reason.